Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's a given Wednesday, and it's uh, Energy in America at 3 o'clock Hawaii time. But we're talking to Washington, or is it New York? Jeff, Jeff Kissel of EPRIG joins us today uh, to discuss the uh, Keystone Pipeline. And we're talking about uh, President Trump's action in restoring, restarting the Keystone Initiative. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, Jay. It's, it's wonderful to be with you. I'm just somewhere east of Burbank, so we'll let's leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. So, um, you know, it was, it was headlines this morning. We like to be current. Um, and uh, President Trump has restarted not only Keystone, but the, the Dakota pipeline. Uh, can you tell us what happened from the energy, energy you know, think tank point of view? Well, this is one of the promises that President Trump made during his campaign that he's, he's following through on. And what he has decided to do is allow the uh, State Department to revisit the decision that the Obama administration made. And the Obama administration, as you may recall, decided against permitting the Keystone Pipeline to move through. Mm -hmm. That pipeline brings crude oil from Alberta, Canada, all the way down to the United States, Texas Gulf Coast. And it's a lot more important for Hawaii than people realize right now and I, I'll be glad to go into the details. Well, let's let's you. talk about the uh, you know the implications of the immediate players first. So the first thing is uh, that the government has clearly changed its policy and on the way to the show I was listening to uh, an NPR story about how how the Trump administration is changing the Department of Justice and there's a lot of concern about uh, the Civil Rights Act matter because uh, he's hired uh, political appointees. That, that is not, not appointees that have to be consented to by the Senate, but appointees that are embedded in the uh, Department of Justice. So we're going to change policy on enforcement of the Civil Rights Act. And so that's hot news now. So I think what we see now four days after the inauguration is he's taking a lot of action uh, in a lot of places and uh, making a lot of changes uh, I suppose m most of them are consistent with what he was saying before. Um, so th this is a change on energy. And uh, what we have here is a, is a change that is going to have ripple effect in many directions. The first, the first effect is, I guess, what, what has happened here is, um, uh, let's see, we have a new, we have a new uh, energy, uh, or at least he's, he will be, and once he's confirmed, we have Rick Perry going to be the new uh, uh, you know, director of energy, and um, he's going to he's going to be consistent with his policy of allowing Keystone and, for that matter, the Dakota pi Pipeline to go forward. Uh, so that's easy. The government has changed. What about Canada? How does this affect Canada? How does it affect? Uh, gee, I guess it has affect the United States. Well, it affects the United States in in a lot of different ways, and I, I want to talk about the Canadian crude in terms of what it really is. It's a, a crude oil that allows the refineries that have been operating in the Texas Gulf and in Louisiana to operate a lot more efficiently and produce a lot more product. The United States is one of the biggest energy exporters in the world. Even though it's illegal to export crude, it is not ex illegal to export product. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a lot more United States oil products exported to Europe, South America, and more importantly, to the Pacific, where they will help hold down the cost of energy in Hawaii, at least until we can put in a, a renewable energy strategy. Uh, what, what's the point, Jeff, of, uh, of not being permitted to export crude but being permitted to export product, what, 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 what's the policy reason for making that distinction? Well, Jay, you're not old enough to remember the 1970s, <laughs> but I am. And, and we had a, a very difficult time with the Arab oil embargo as a country, and especially in Hawaii. And, and during those times, they passed a lot of legislation. And one of the laws that was passed, and, and in fact, it, it predated the oil embargo because it came in when crude oil was price control, was that we, we decided that as a matter of public policy, we would not allow the crude oil to be exported from the United States. We wanted to encourage the development of refinery capacity in the United States, so we allowed refined products to be exported. 
Nice. That's really the genesis of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, arguably, I suppose uh, uh, you could you make a buck on refining and then exporting, and uh, that, that way you're not subject to the market of commodities. And of course, you know, the, the Second World War was fresh in everyone's memory. And one of the reasons we were able to prevail in the Second World War was because we had a lot of our own crude production and we produced the refined products that, that allowed us, as, as President Roosevelt's advisor said, to float to victory on a sea of oil. Mm -hmm. Really, so, that did happen. So this is coming from Alberta. Uh, Alberta has a lot of oil, a huge oil industry. Um, but you know, in the case of natural gas, which we're not talking about natural gas, we're talking about oil right now, um, natural gas had the promise of lasting for a long time and being cheap for a long time. Uh, in this case, um, you know, are we, are we subject to a limitation on the, on the quantity? Uh, is this going to be subject to the whole analysis of peak oil? Um, and, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, how important is the pipeline in delivering that and how much money would be spent on it and is it worth it? Well, let's talk about those in three sections. Okay. The concept of peak oil is gone. Oil is really available in almost any quantity we wanted. It's a matter of the cost to produce it. Mm -hmm. The unconventional oil that's been discovered over the last 10 years is being exploited only one or two percent of its total resource. So 98 percent of the unconventional oil that we know about is still in the ground. And at, at $50 a barrel, it's barely break even to produce it. At $100 a barrel, they make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. At $500 a barrel, you can imagine how much of that oil could be produced. So the idea of, of a limited oil supply is really a, an idea that kind of died a number of years ago. Now, that doesn't mean we should be using more oil. All it means is that we have to look at it in different terms. Instead of looking at it as a supply issue, we've got to look at it as a cost issue, as an environmental issue, as mm -hmm. a quality of life issue. Those are very, very important things, equally important to how much oil there is absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Now, forgetting Hawaii for a minute, just looking at, at the country in general, um, is, is oil a bridge fuel for the country in general? Uh, shouldn't the country in general be moving to non-fossil fuels? Um, aren't we concerned about the environment and global warming? America is moving away from fossil fuels. And the market is moving America away from fossil fuels. They're doing it in a number of ways. The, the most important one is that there is a public awareness that, that fuels that produce excessive greenhouse gas are not good. So when they make purchasing decisions, they're aware of, just like they're aware of of how humanely the, the tuna is, is captured and whether it's dolphin free, and whether they are aware of whether they're walking into a green building and whether Procter & Gamble or Coca-Cola will build their next factory as an energy efficient, environmentally friendly factory so they can put that on their label. Mm -hmm. those, those, uh, those, that public is developing that awareness and that's a, a really f positive thing. The other thing that's happened, of course, is that the public knows that oil can rise to 120 or 140 dollars a barrel and beyond. So they're they're still conserving it. Although my my friends and neighbors who are buying larger and larger cars now that gasoline is cheap are not <laughs> good true. examples. But the airlines certainly are good examples, and they're very good citizens these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, you know what what do you say to the argument that? Uh, if we, if we didn't uh, have a big supply of oil, um, we would be forced uh, to spend our money and our, you know, our, our effort on, on building renewables. Uh, if we have an easy supply of oil, uh, then we're less motivated to move to renewables, I mean, nationally. That's actually not the case. If you look at the statistics, and that's what our, our organization does, we look at these statistics we see that we are investing more and more in renewables and less 
in traditional conventional fuels. And it's because we're meeting public demand. The Tesla motor car company, the, the people who are building now five manufacturers of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, the people who are building energy efficient water heaters, air conditioners, heat pumps and appliances, they're, they're all moving away from oil, even though oil is relatively inexpensive. Oil is cheaper than, in real terms, oil is cheaper than it has been in almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. What is it right now? Oh, oil is around $50 a barrel, a little mm -hmm. bit over. So it's hanging in there for the past six months anyway. Oil went up to $44 a barrel in 1974. <laughs> that today would be almost $200 a barrel in today's <laughs> really, really state. Yeah. Unfortunately, so, I remember those days when, when people had to make choices between buying food and heating their homes in the winter. May come again. Who knows? So well, going back to, you know, the people who are involved, you know, the sort of the spokes in the wheel, the people who feel the ripple effect, what about the oil companies? You know, what does Keystone mean to the oil companies? And I include Exxon with due regard for Rex Tillerson. Um, the oil companies benefit by having Keystone and for that matter, the Dakota pipeline? Rex is going to make the decision on the Keystone pipeline, of course. Because right, it's Secretary of State, of course. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that is, that's going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to be aware of that. The oil companies today are not near the same organizations they were 25 or, or even 10 years ago. Most of the oil companies have divested themselves of their oil refineries mm -hmm. and their distribution systems. They're producing crude oil and natural gas. And it's, that's a financial decision that they have made because the capital in the oil industry is, is actually diminishing as the price of oil declines. Mm -hmm. There's less of an incentive to put capital into it. Mm -hmm. Those same oil companies, for an example, BP, are, are investing very heavily in renewables and energy efficiency products and and a whole host of other things that are related to their industry including technology yeah good for them that's smart you got to move you got to move with the changing changing time one more question before we go to our break jeff and that is this so this morning uh with the stroke of a pen effectively um, the president uh, reversed the obama decision on the keystone and i guess on the uh, dakota pipeline and now, uh, now it's going to be, it's going to happen, but it's still in development and the development company hasn't finished building the pipeline. I guess it'll take some time. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, how long will it take to finish the whole thing? You know, all the construction contemplated, it, it crosses the country uh, north to south. Um, and how long will it be before we actually see some oil flow through that pipeline or those pipelines? And how long will it be before it has an effect on things, on prices, on supply, whatever? Most of the pipeline is already installed. It won't take long for them to install the remainder of the pipeline, but it's already having an impact on the market because people anticipate the future in mm. their purchasing mm. decisions mm. today. So the Texas Gulf refineries are investing in upgrading their hardware so they can take advantage of that crude oil and they can blend it with the crude oil that they get locally and make the, the products that are so important to this economy as, as we move forward. So how long would you say? Is it, is it weeks? Is it months? Is it years? Before it's it'll actually few, you know, spill out the other side? It's a, it's a few years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I don't know how long it will take the State Department to actually make the decision. I don't know whether there'll be court challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are a lot of things that can go on um, once the State Department makes its decision. And uh, you've got to allow for that to occur. Yeah, and you this can bet the environmentalists are going to be hot on this issue. And uh, the Indian tribes involved, they'll be hot on this issue. And anybody who supports the environmentalists, um, you know, who feels, uh, you know, strongly about climate change for that matter, 
um, or who supports the Indian tribes is going to be hot on this issue. So I think your suggestion of the possibility of, of litigation uh, is, um, well, there's a fair chance that'll happen, don't you think? I think there's a substantial chance you're going to see public protest. I think you're going to see litigation. And uh, I think you will see attempts after the decision is made to, to change that decision. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to tell you what the outcome of, of that activity will be, but it, it's, it's clear that, that if you look at the demonstrations that are occurring today in the country, that people are in the mood to become more activist than, than they were years ago. So. Yeah, so interesting. We, in the Chinese sense, we live in interesting times. Now let's take one minute break, uh, Jeff Kissel. That's Jeff Kissel of Epring Energy Policy. And in, in uh, what was it, Washington and New York? I never, I never got that straight. We are, we're in Washington, D.C., but I'm sitting in New York City right now. Okay, and I'm sitting here in Honolulu, and we're both going to take a break at the same time. Magic, the magic of telecom. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians, or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward, and the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon, and let's move Hawaii forward. Okay, we're back for live. This is Think Tech on a given Wednesday afternoon with the three o'clock rock. And we do, as we do very often, uh, energy in America. And today we're doing with, uh, with Jeff Kissel, who is with EPRINC in Washington, D.C., but he joins us by Skype from New York. So, Jeff, uh, you had plenty of experience uh, and time in grade, and time as the CEO of Hawaii Gas to study the Hawaii market and to figure out the ripple effects of these changes in energy supply on Hawaii. So we spoke, we spoke about um, you know, the, the oil industry, we spoke about you know, the protest groups, the environmental groups, we, we spoke about the country in general, but we really haven't uh, drilled down on what, what, what this means for Hawaii. Let's assume for this discussion that protest or not, Keystone is open. Let's assume for this discussion that they finish the pipeline and it actually supplies Canadian oil, Alberta oil, uh, into the United States. How does this affect Hawaii and when? I have, I have a different way of describing this because I think it's, I, would, I need to lay a little bit of foundation and I, I hope I don't put people to sleep doing it. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Hawaii has decided to pursue a renewable energy strategy. Whether that is 50% or 100% doesn't matter. Hawaii is directionally moving toward using more renewables in the future, not less. In doing that, it has decided not to take any intermediate steps, but to move from oil, which is largely responsible for Hawaii's, supplying Hawaii's energy needs, to renewables. Well, if you move from one thing to another, you have to get there. And unless you're going to use some other means to get there, like magic, you're stuck with oil being the bridge to Hawaii's renewable energy future. Can I dwell on that for a minute with you? Sure. Why, why do we need a bridge? I mean, why can't we just hunker down right now that the 2017 legislature does what it has to do in terms of tax credits and incentives, uh, that, it, that it moves the economics around so that we, the people, have no choice but to get off fossil fuel and go to clean energy right now on an accelerated, accelerated basis. Why, why can't we do that? Do you remember 9-11 when the hotels emptied? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and nobody flew on any airplanes? 
<laughs> okay. Or the economic collapse of, of the first part of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. That is essentially what you're looking at if, if we shut off the oil economically, not physically. And, and what would happen would be airplane tickets would go back to $1,000 a seat for economy class. Electricity would go from the current $125, $130 a month that everyone is, that the average household is currently paying to $500 a month that many of us used to pay. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you convert the price of a barrel of oil to the energy cost in a kilowatt of electricity, or in uh, terms of a, a revenue passenger mile on an airplane, it's horrific. And I did the math for you, Jay, just so that you could uh, get a, a feel for it. Today, at $52 a barrel, if you were to buy that same barrel, which we all do, in terms of kilowatt hours of electricity, the real cost that we're paying is $650. How do you get to that? Barrel of electricity is is costing about $650. I don't I don't know whether you you can see my slides, but basically there are 1628 kilowatt hours of energy in a 42 gallon barrel of oil. Mm -hmm. If you pay $52 for that barrel raw, that's fine. But we can't when we buy it through the power lines. We pay 40 cents a kilowatt hour. You multiply 40 cents times 1,628 and you get $650 a barrel. Mm -hmm. So if we were to raise the cost, you know, let's just say the state of Hawaii decided that public policy required that we, we grossly increase the price of oil. Let's say the state of Hawaii wanted to bring that price back up to 2007, 8, 9 levels, make it $150. That means you're going to be paying almost $2,000 a barrel for the electricity that you buy from the neighborhood power company. Today, the average cost of solar electric per barrel in the United States on an equivalent basis is less than two hundred dollars. So people so would be driven. Would people would then be driven to solar right right away, wouldn't they? Yes, but unfortunately, the state of Hawaii has managed to kill off residential solar, and I, I can't tell you why they've done it, but I can tell you that from installing a megawatt a month on top of people's rooftops, they've gone to practically nothing. So for Hawaii to, to move to a renewable energy strategy, it's putting more and more oil in the way right now. What I hear you saying is that when you're talking about sort of the ship of the economic state, so to speak, you can't make um, disruptive changes. And disruptive changes, you know, they, they can be nice theoretically, but when you get down to the ground, the way people live and how their pocketbooks work, um, disruptive changes are very painful. And therefore, uh, what I hear you saying is therefore a bridge uh, would make it less painful, would, would allow us to stretch it over time. Regardless of how you do this, you're stuck with oil until it's done. And that's, that's what's happened. Now, Hawaii has managed to slow itself down dramatically by killing off the residential solar industry. It, it's just put a huge roadblock in its own way. And Hawaii is already a very, very high cost environment. The, just to give you three quick examples, the cost of the rail transit in Hawaii for the 18 miles is nearly six times the cost of that same transit built in Los Angeles, Dallas, and a number of metropolitan areas. The cost of the worker doing work in Pearl Harbor 
is the highest cost for that kind of work in any shipyard in the United States. When you, when you look at that and combine that with the other costs that our citizens have to incur, if you were to, to layer on oil taxes and higher energy costs, what you're doing is you're slowing development. You're not speeding up that bridge to the future. Mm -hmm. Pushing the goalposts yeah. out. Yeah. Well, that would be a great concern. So uh, looking at it from that point of view, we only have two or three minutes left here. Looking at it from that point of view, um, what, what should happen here? I guess, I guess your view of it is that whatever the other considerations are around Keystone for Hawaii on an economic basis, what I hear you saying is we, we, could, we could use oil at a cheaper price, we could use a greater supply, we could use a domestic supply instead of from the Middle East, um, and, the, and Keystone helps do all of that. Therefore, what I hear you saying is uh, Keystone is something that we should support, despite you know, the fact that a lot of people are really off fossil fuel in the state. They don't want any part of it. Uh, but the fact, as you have explained it, is that, like it or not, we need it. You know, you, you, you need it because without inexpensive oil, solar, wind, and the other forms of renewable energy get further, pushed further and further off into the distance. And as a result, there's more vulnerability to the economy if oil prices go up in the interim. Because oil is all we've got right now for 87% of the energy requirement in the state of Hawaii. And that you can't ch change that yeah, well, we without, without investment. If you're paying money for high-priced oil, that money is not available to invest in efficient, reasonably priced renewables. Yeah, and, and we have a million cars on the road, and they're all, most, you know, short of, ex except for 5,000 of them, uh, they're all fossil fuel cars. We have our utility system is pretty much all driven on fossil fuels, so that would be disruptive at the least. But let me ask you, you know, what, uh, what is your advice then on how we reach um, our energy goals, which we talk about a lot, and the Energy Policy Forum, of which I am a member, talks about a lot. How do we reach those goals and factor all these considerations in and not lose a hold of time, a lot of time, or, big point, Jeff, get distracted? Because the risk of a bridge fuel is you get married to it, and then you can't get away from it. Uh, this would be really bad for us because then we'd be losing the initiative we have spent so much time and energy, no pun intended, uh, on developing, and still are. How do we handle this? What's your advice? The answer, the answer is investment, and you've got to create an environment where investment is favorable. You can't have a five-hour gridlock because you had a water main failure. And, and expect an economy to function. That's, that's a symptom of a far greater problem. It's lack of investment. And, and if you put roadblocks in your way, you basically make investment less and less viable. Oil is the Hawaii bridge to the future. Uh, you know, our, our institute is not advocating it. We're, we're stating fact. <laughs> okay. Sure is the sun rising. <laughs> Jeff, it's great to talk to you. I, I sure enjoy it. It feels like you're right across the table from me. I hope I get to see you, you know, personally soon. Wish you well for 2017. Hope we can do more shows like this and, and cover these subjects as they go forward, because there will be more news, I guarantee it for you. Jeff Kissel. Uh, with, uh, Jay, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Jeff. Aloha, Jeff.